well. Um, so welcome to this workshop. Um, it's being hosted by myself, Adrian Lord from PJA. I was involved in writing uh, um, Local Transport Note 120 and the Active Travel Wales guidance and uh, some of the Highways England uh, guidance as well. Um, and Lucy Marstrand from, is it Metis Consultants? Is that how you say yeah. it? That's right, Adrian, yeah. yeah, from Metis Consultants. Yeah, uh, and we're going to talk about uh, inclusivity in design and placemaking and what we mean by that. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what we did uh, in putting some of the guidance documents together to try to ensure that they were in inclusive. And then Lucy is going to go through some real life examples and think about some of the people that uh, we are not perhaps considering when we are talking about inclusivity. So I'll, I'll kick off. Um, it is a workshop, so I've got a couple of, uh, you know, I've got a few short slides, but um, the idea is that we'll talk for a little while, but then um, we'll have a discussion. Um, so after I finish my presentation, we'll probably just take um, questions and clarifications but we'll um do the main discussion after lucy's uh, presentation if you can use the q a feature um you'll see on the top uh, right of your screen to write down your questions um and then lucy and i'll keep an eye on those and, and we'll take those as as they come um during the discussion so um, what do we mean by inclusivity? Um, oops. Um, so there's quite a strong statement right at the beginning of uh, Local Transport Note 120. Um, LTM 120 deals with cycle infrastructure design. So um, we're particularly focused on um, inclusivity with regard to cycle facilities. Um, and, you know, we, we make this point that, um, you know, there is a legal duty um, for, for public sector providers to ensure that the environment is accessible to as many people as uh, is possible. Um, and we sometimes talk about disabled people, particularly during consultation, it's uh, pitched as cyclists want this thing and disabled people don't want it, but a lot of um, people who ride cycles are disabled themselves and so uh, you know they they may have just a normal uh, bicycle or they may have some kind of adapted cycle but they're using their um, cycle to help them to get around so as I say there are different definitions and different uh, thoughts about what we mean by inclusive. So one is the Equality Act, and um, that talks about a number of protected characteristics. So it's not just about disability, and Lucy's going to pick up on some more of those. Um, accessible to all, so people of all abilities. So we shouldn't be building infrastructure that is only suitable for um, experienced cyclists. Um, it, it should also be suitable for somebody who is fairly new to cycling has and just got a basic level of competence um, we sometimes phrase that as eight to eighties so that was something that was uh, very much part of the kind of world sustainable cities agenda that we should be accessible to all age groups and in becca's plenary presentation just now she also talked about fairness as an aspect of transport and walking and cycling um, are generally accessible to all people in that there isn't so much of an economic barrier to be able to use those modes but sometimes the way that we've uh, arranged our roads and our land use excludes people from access to certain opportunities to goods and services and i always remember we didn't have a car when my children were growing up and uh, you used to dread it sometimes if somebody was having a birthday party at some kind of out of town pub on the ring road or whatever you know trying to get there with your cycle trailer in a fairly hostile environment was always uh, pretty horrible and, and you can see how um 
some of those things which people sort of take for granted in a car-based society can be more difficult if you don't have access to a car. Um, and we also talk about um, inclusive in terms of sustainability. Um, you know, we get a lot of pop-up infrastructure and um, short-term encouragement measures and so on. But sustainable should be have an element of permeability, uh, sorry, permanence, um, and it should be there for the long with kind of that long term um, impact on the environment in mind. So in terms of how we try to make the guidance as inclusive as possible, we did uh, I have to admit, fall into the trap of thinking mainly about inclusivity with regards to disabled people. Um, so we had inputs from all of these sort of professional organisations and from the various advocacy groups, uh, the transport advocacy gr groups, um, and from the disability advocates via DIPTAC and some individual representations as well. Um, and in addition to that, there were kind of checks within the department to ensure that what we were saying reflected the legality of uh, the Highways Act and the um, um, uh, and the um, uh, sorry the the um, uh, various accessibility acts and so on. Um, and in terms of the sort of technical content, we imported. Uh, um, elements from existing guidance um, to ensure that uh, what we were putting in reflected good practice. Um, we um, recruited some people from Wheels for Wellbeing to uh, cycle around um, some, some of the places in London so that they could be included um, on various different types of cycle um, in some of the infrastructure examples and we also used those uh, adapted cycles in some of the um technical um diagrams as well one thing that we talked about um when we were sort of putting this diagram together which is sort of the sort of linchpin of uh, a lot of the guidance is uh, thinking about the user needs and uh, again the amber sections within this diagram represent uh, some of the work that's been done by Rachel Aldred and University of Westminster and others about what types of infrastructure most people will consider to be acceptable. So um, the pink or the sort of ready colour in the bottom right, most people, regardless of their level of cycling ability, will struggle in those circumstances and, and we'll find that that infrastructure fairly unaccess uh, unacceptable. Um, the amber, some people, the more confident and competent cyclists, um, the more able-bodied people will find that those conditions reasonably acceptable. Um, the green is what most people will find acceptable and accessible um, uh, and that reflects some of the qualitative guidance that, uh, as I say, that's been done, as well as some of the sort of practicalities of uh, road traffic danger and traffic conditions. So thinking about where some of this stuff goes wrong, um, sometimes we just don't engage with ordinary people, you know, the people who aren't uh, experts and aren't particularly enthused about this, um, to find out ex exactly what what it is that they want um, and, and it's quite difficult you know because uh, they'll see you know any consultation it, it, they generally disregard it because they think oh it's about cycling it's not um, you know it, it's not relevant to me um, sometimes we fail to take into account some of the other road users and some of the issues that they are facing um, uh, and therefore we don't necessarily come up with the correct solution um, and some of the people who are on the ground who are actually dealing with operations they, they will come back with a completely different set of issues um, which are more about how people behave and use some of the infrastructure in ways that we didn't intend so that they might um, you know have a, a different perspective based on their lived experience of actually trying to look after um, 
the the um, infrastructure and manage how how people are using it. Um, Lucy is going to talk particularly about um, children and their experience. Again, how do we capture their perspective on things? They have a very different view of the world, um, not least because they are shorter, so they can't see around things like um, bollards and guide rail, um, guard rail, and so on. Um, and also these kind of journalists, um, you know, we'll probably never change the day. Daily Mail because that's how it makes its money by kind of trying to create scandal and conflict and tell everybody how terrible the world is and how awful councils are. But, um, you know, there are papers that have changed their view on cycling and particularly when I lived in London in the 1980s and early 1990s, the uh, London Evening Standard was very, very anti-cycling. It was pretty much the same. Uh, coverage as you would get in the Daily Mail um, but you know nowadays it, it has a much more val balanced view and, and tends to come down in favour of cycling on the whole um, so, so you know we can probably have an impact with, with some of the, the media influences there so just kind of to throw out these sort of challenges for the discussion later you know how can we engage better to ensure that we are truly inclusive and not just um, representing the views and the needs of certain niche user groups. Um, everybody is different and sometimes people have uh, quite contrary user needs um, which we then need to reconcile in design so uh, that is a challenge um, you know there are probably no easy answers to that who should be involved and how do we get them involved? Um, how do we learn from experience? So one of the issues for the industry as a whole is that um, people like me come in as consultants, we work in an area, then we disappear off to our next job. So there is no corporate memory of what went well, what went badly for a particular scheme. So how do we learn from that experience and capture that? Um, uh, and then how do we foster innovation and not hide behind standards, uh, guidance, custom and practice? So, uh, uh, again, how do we uh, sort of uh, think about um, if somebody comes up with a great idea, how do we then put that into practice? Because, again, it, it can be quite difficult within the uh, rules and guidance that, that we have at the moment. So I'll finish there and um, stop presenting, if you can remember how to do that, and hand over to Lucy. Brilliant. Thanks, Adrian. That's a really good starting point for my talk, which I'll just... Um, can people see that? Is that visible to you, Adrian? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let me just. OK. Um, so, yeah, I'm, my name's Lucy Marstrand, as Adrian mentioned, um, working for Metis Consultants. Um, and I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, inclusive design and what that really means um, for us as practitioners. Um, Adrian mentioned that the uh, LTM 120 is kind of rooted in the Equality Act, but I thought it's just worth highlighting some of the other acts that we need to be thinking about when we're designing schemes. Um, so there are three that I think are probably most relevant. There's the Education Act, which says we need to promote the use of sustainable transport um, to schools. There's the Health and Social Care Act, which, as the name suggests, says we need to promote health for all. Um, the, these are kind of duties placed on local authorities. Um, and then finally, there's the Equality Act, which is the one that tends to uh, be cited when we're thinking about inclusive design. And, and so that is the one that I'm going to kind of focus on mainly. But the Equality Act has uh, cites these various protected characteristics. Um, so there's obviously disability, which um, is really important, age, pregnancy and maternity, 
uh, sex or gender, race, um, and there are a number of other ones. But those are probably the most pertinent to walking and cycling um, in terms of what we need to be thinking about when we design things. Um, I just wanted to highlight uh, kind of a bit of a gap in our thinking. So when we talk about inclusive design and when we draft inclusive design strategies, they do tend to be focused on disabled people which is obviously absolutely critical and really important that we create spaces that everybody can use. But um, so, for example, we've got here the DFT's inclusive transport strategy. It does say it's about achieving equal access for disabled people. So it's explicitly stating it's for disabled people. Um, and I just went through it as a kind of uh, doing a quick check on the number of mentions. And we've got 188 mentions for disabled people, three for children. Two for, two for women and none for pregnant women. But that does kind of beg the question of what about these other protected groups? Do we then have an inclusive transport strategy um, achieving equal access for all ages, all genders and so on? Um, so I think there's a little bit of a gap in thinking. Um, one of the issues potentially is that because, because say women and children aren't really a minority, we tend to think um, that that they're not maybe their trips aren't going to be so distinct or specific but actually when you look at trips made by children for example they are very specific so the ch children's most frequent trip type is going to school um, or, or a place of education and their most significant trip in terms of distance is visiting friends well that's very different um, to, to, to other groups um, when we think about uh, kind of, I was just did this breakdown of um, commuting trips and escort education trips by gender. So on the left hand side is commuting, and you can see there that in terms of distance, men commute about twice as far um, as women do. Um, in terms of trip rates for commuting, uh, men make more commuting trips. Obviously, women make quite a few as well. Um, and when you look at escort education, it's almost kind of the reverse. So women are making twice as much um, in terms of distance for escorting their children to school. Um, and in terms of rates, it's, it's more than twice as much. So there's significant differences there, um, just purely in terms of gender. And I probably show this uh, slide in almost every presentation I do, um, but it, I've actually had kind of counsellors saying this can't be true and they don't believe this is possible. Um, but commuting is only 15% of trips. And yet a lot of our transport planning tools um, and the data we gather is based on the commute. With COVID, we've seen a reduction in commuting because a lot of people are working from home. So arguably, as we kind of move into the future, the commute is going to become even less important because fewer people are making those trips. Um, and that means that as a proportion, other trips are more significant. But even now, it, uh, trips for education make up around 13% of trips. So they're, all, they're already on a par with commuting. And I suppose, sorry, the other thing to mention is that a lot of these, these trips like to school or to shops um, or to the park are quite short trips. So they could be done uh, if you're on walking sort of uh, they could be walked or cycled, but the infrastructure needs to be right, um, particularly for children. This is just a comparison of the propensity from the propensity to cycle tools. So on the left hand side, you've got um, the potential for cycling to work trips. It's an image of London. Um, and you can see there that as you move into the centre of the city, uh, you've got these dark blue lines and they increase in density. Um, so the potential for cycling increases as you move into the centre for work trips. But when you look at trip patterns for school, the potential for travel to school by bicycle is as high in the suburban areas as it is in the city centre. Um, so that, that kind of raises questions for how we plan cycle networks. Um, but when we look at cycle networks, um, so this is two that I've just taken from uh, British cities, so the top one is London and the bottom one is Manchester, they still tend to be very much focused on this idea that people want to go into the middle of a city and back out again, rather than maybe a trip from um, one suburb to another. And I think if we're moving towards inclusive planning, we need to look at 
we need something much more like the image on the right. So a fine grid network. Um, this is taken from Amsterdam. But you can see there that the density and the kind of quality, actually, when you go to Amsterdam, the quality of the outer routes is as high um, in the suburbs as it is in the middle of Amsterdam. Part of the issue um, no doubt relates to the way that we kind of gather data and the type of data that we collect. So the commuting data, we have this regular 10 yearly ONS census, which is very high quality, very detailed, reliable data. Um, and I think probably most transport practitioners use it an awful lot. Um, but when it comes to school data, it's much more patchy. Um, so the government collected scat travel to school data between 2008 and 2011, but then that data was dropped. Um, so we've got a situation where some authorities have really good data for their schools and others don't. Um, and also it's not as readily accessible, uh, partly because of the patchiness of it. Um, so it would be great to see uh, kind of consistent annual data being collected for schools. Um, and it would also help things like the propensity to cycle tool, which is based on the school's data. Um, and at the moment, that propensity to cycle tool is beginning to look a bit old, simply because the data is a little bit old for, for travel to school. Um, so why is it so important? Why am I talking about children? Um, because we know that they make trips which are of a distance that they could cycle, but also they want to cycle. Children like being active. Um, so you've got really half of primary school children saying they want to cycle to school. Three quarters of children um, live within 15 minutes bike ride for secondary school travel. So that's an awful lot of children potentially cycling to school, secondary school. And yet only 2% of kids cycle. I mapped out this chart just showing, um, yeah, I was kind of, <laughs> I was just, it, it's, I think it's kind of striking just how how much child independent travel is affected by the presence of motor traffic. So the red dotted line here maps out the percentage of children traveling to school by themselves at primary school age. And you can see there in 1970, you've got 95% of kids going to school by themselves. So that's ages five to 11. By 2020, it's gone down to 2%. But what is interesting is it's mirrored almost exactly by the rise in motor traffic. So the thing that puts people off uh, allowing their child to cycle to school or walk to school by themselves, it's not stranger danger, although that might be an issue. But the main reason parents cite is fear of motor traffic. So that's something that we need to address. Um, I'm also kind of interested in the language that we use for road safety. Um, and particularly this idea of vulnerable road users. When we look at this image of these children playing, I think it's from a kind of pre-war photo, but uh, they're just playing out, they're playing a sports game that they've uh, conjured up and they're chatting. Uh, you can see there are a few adults wandering around as well. But these people in this day and age, we call them vulnerable road users. Um, but I think what's important is they're not vulnerable in themselves. They're external. It's kind of external factors that make them vulnerable. So when we permit motor traffic to go down the road at speed, that has an impact on the child's vulnerability. But it's important that we understand that they are external factors. You know, it's the road environment. It's the way our laws fail potentially to protect children. Um, so they're not inherently vulnerable. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, I would be really pleased if we could kind of move more towards the social model of vulnerability in the way that we have for disability um, and understand that a lot of the things that make people vulnerable um, are external. This is um, a, an area that I visited uh, quite recently. So it's in Southwark in South London. Um, and I, this is actually pre-COVID. So this is from Google Earth. But you can see there it's um, you've got a kind of protected cycle route. You've got two lanes for motor traffic um, and then some crossings. And it's quite a busy junction. And this is it having filtered out the motor traffic. And what you see is this kind of transformed space. Suddenly, 
Um, you've got lots of people using it, more people potentially uh, than when it was open to motor traffic. The way they're using it's different. And you've got this variety of people in terms of age. And actually, um, Anna Goodman and some of her colleagues have been studying the cycling diversity of this scheme, which is really interesting. So they found that 37% of adults cycling through this area are, are women, which compares to the London average of 30%. And 23%, which is really staggering for the UK, 23% are children compared to the national average of 2%. So what we're finding is when you remove motor traffic, the space becomes much more inclusive and equal. Um, and it would be great to see actually the, the kind of measuring of diversity of cycling becoming a core part of what, uh, what we measure. So not just looking at the levels of cycling, but also looking at the age, gender, ethnicity, and so on of, of people using that space. Um, this has come up already, but uh, so Roger was talking about the, the kind of reality of uh, support for, for traffic reduction, but we know that nationally um, there is strong support for less traffic. And when we think of kind of low traffic neighbourhoods, there has been a lot of noise and um, kind of media attention about their contentiousness, um, but they are nevertheless a very rapid, effective way to um, create more equal spaces and healthier spaces. Um, and, and they've been shown to reduce traffic uh, traffic collisions and that kind of thing. Um, I think, yeah, we're, we're kind of stuck in them at the moment between this sort of fear of change um, that we've seen with some of the low traffic neighbourhood media reporting um, and the need for us to actually make rapid change because of climate change. Um, and, and then there was COVID previously, but I think that there's a sort of tension there which we haven't haven't really managed to address um when we look at the past 20 years cycle use has been hovering at less than two percent of all trips so that's really um kind of quite a small percentage but what's interesting is there's been a lot of noise a lot of policy um a lot of government noise around cycle sort of their desire to increase cycling over the last 20 years but it hasn't really had much impact on the ground um, and similarly, when you look at London, mode share was 1.2% in 2000, and it's risen to 2.4% in 2019. So over a 20 year period, it's risen by, by kind of just over 1%. And if we continue at that rate, it's going to take us hundreds of years, 500 years to get to the levels of cycling we now see in a place like Amsterdam. So there needs to be much more rapid, significant change, much more funding, um, as, as Becca pointed out, than we currently have. Um, yeah, there's, there's actually a poll in, if you click on the polls tab next to comments, there's a poll there that I'd be interested um, for you to fill in. But yeah, on, on the kind of issue of how we consult, the government guidance, it does point people towards LTM 120, which within LTM 120, it talks about uh, consulting with children and other groups. But on the DFT guidance, the first thing that you come to, it actually says, consider in particular local chiefs of police and emergency services, local businesses, the Royal Mail um, and local disability groups. Now, clearly, all of those groups are very important, but it would be nice if it had also said something along the lines of, you know, don't forget children and young people, caregivers, um, you know, mums for lungs playing out these other groups need to be considered when we're consulting. So the poll that um, we've put together actually relates to this question of who do you consult with as a local authority um, or as a consultant when you're doing schemes? So if you could answer that, that would be fantastic. Um, and yeah, here are my contact details uh, if you want to discuss anything further. So I think now we're gonna go and have a kind of bit more of an open discussion, Adrian, is that right? Yeah, that's correct. So we, we've had a few uh, questions in the Q&A. So I, I'll start with, um, with with the first one, which uh, Alison Hill um, uh, posed was uh, when um, whether 
an A-Dredge is being used by planners and uh, traffic engineers when designing cycle infrastructure. So, um, you know, wh whether anybody in, in practice thinks about that 8 to 80 criteria. Um, so I suppose, yeah, is do they? I, I, I mean, they need to. And I, I mean, there was I noticed some discussion about this 8 to 80 because, um, I mean, my kids were cycling by kind of three or four. So what do you do for the next five years between three and eight? That's quite a long time frame when children kind of could potentially be active cycling around the place that if we designed for eight to 80, we're not including them. Um, so, yeah, whether whether people do or not, I suppose my feeling is that a lot of local authorities don't currently think about age as a significant um, you know, as a significant protected characteristic under the Equality Act um, in terms of cycling. And that is something that needs to come up the agenda much, much more. Um, yeah, her, Alison's questions are actually slightly blurred out on my thing, but I don't know whether. All right. Yeah, uh, so, so, so that was the main question. I don't, I don't know if there's uh, anybody else from uh, local authorities who wants to uh, also either reply in the Q&A or um, make a comment in the Q&A. Um, so the, the next question was about uh, the space requirement for sort of parallel straight across and staggered pedestrian crossings. I'll just share something from uh, Norwich. Um, so this is what was a, uh, a um, staggered uh, pedestrian crossing with, with quite a long um, stagger on it. And you can see that in, in this case, um, it, this is in Norwich where the pedestrians still have a, a bit of a stagger, um, but the cyclists have got an almost straight across crossing, but still with that option to wait in the middle. And um, again, they are both crossing at the same time so it, it needn't necessarily obviously this won't work everywhere but it needn't necessarily be a one completely separate facility and two a straight across for cyclists and a, a, a two-stage crossing for pedestrians you know you, th there are other options are available so uh so yeah i don't know if uh, there are any other sort of comments uh, around um around crossing design, um, but space is always at a premium on nearly every uh, design that we work on. Uh, uh, it's very rarely, yeah. Um, yeah. Actually, it, I've got um, a quick question, Adrian, just on, on the crossings. We, I know we've traditionally designed crossings to meet the, the kind of timings of able-bodied people, so not thinking so much about somebody who might be slower either because they're older or disabled or encumbered in some way. Is, is that still the case for LTN 120? Do, have there been, um, I mean, I kind of know the answer to this, but I just wondered what, yeah, what are your thoughts on that in relation to LTN 120, the timings? Yeah, um, well, obviously within LTN 120, we put in some uh, revised timings with regard to cyclists and, and setting off. Um, and there has been a fairly uh, consistent campaign by Living Streets and others uh, for, for the last, well, for the last 10 years, really, about some of the assumptions made about pedestrian walking speeds um, in existing guidance. Um, and in, it's in Chapter 6 of the Traffic Signs Manual. Um, so, so uh, you know, you do have the freedom to you know, if you are designing a crossing that is in a place that is used by a lot of uh, more elderly people or people with mobility impairment, that you can increase those crossing times. Um, you can increase the intergreens to enable people to clear um, larger junctions. So, so it's all within the technical ability. Um, it, it's just uh, more of a political and pragmatic decision about you know, do we accept potential additional delay to motorists at some of those locations um, uh, and the knock-on effects of congestion that that might cause? Or do we prioritise um, the, the sustainable modes? Okay, thank you. And yeah, there's a question from Mary Clark. Um, 
where space is at a premium, how do we build future proof schemes that will cater for the increase in walking and cycling? So I guess, um, you know, where, where you haven't got obvious space for a protected cycle route um, going in each direction, what do you do? I mean, I could sort of begin to answer that. I think I do think we need some tools that allow us to remove traffic lanes potentially in one direction and see what the impacts will be in terms of cycling and overall people capacity on that space. But Adrian, have you got any more thoughts about that? What, what do you do where there's not enough space um, for a protected cycle route? Well, the, um, the, the only thing that you can do is start to look at um, traffic reduction and speed reduction and, and what are the options um, for, for doing that and you know that that will quite often coincide with the sort of placemaking agenda and you know it may be that you can um, potentially release space through taking out or moving some of the parking um, and so on but uh, yeah where, where you've got situation where you've already done all those things that then it, it is you know do, does all of that traffic need to be going through there or can you do other traffic management to take some of that traffic away from that particular location great thank you and then there's a question from richard smith um so fear of change applies to existing routes such as through green spaces with white line segregation but width and the latest guidance lends itself to removing the line. Some like, others not. Okay, well, the I mean, the evidence on advisory cycle lanes is they actually increase injuries. Um, so there was that piece of... Yeah, I think Richard's talking about uh, where we put in a shared use pass through a green space. Oh, okay, so, sorry, uh, yeah. The, there was a lot of... Um, certainly during the sort of late 1990s early 2000s the default was to try and put in either a white line which was useless because uh, people with uh, uh, sight impairments can't detect it anyway um, uh, and everybody else ignores it um, to put in the raised white line uh, diagram 104 1.1 uh, which was kind of raised thermoplastic white line which uh, breaks up after six months and, and is a constant maintenance nightmare and looks awful and again most people ignore it or whether to uh, which is the sort of default that we've tried to encourage in the both highways england and, and uh, ltn is to not put in segregation um, so that people can share the full width of the path um, there is resistance amongst uh, advocacy groups to that because uh, you know, blind people in particular feel uncomfortable about sharing space with cyclists kind of brushing past them. Um, you know, it, it, it is shocking for them um, uh, and not a good experience. So, uh, so, so it's, you know, how do we, um, how, how do we sort of reconcile those different needs? I think for the majority of users that kind of being able to use the whole space to avoid one another there, um, is probably the best solution and it, it's least antagonistic because people don't get cross about people being on the wrong side. Um, but but yeah, for, for blind people in particular, it, it can be more of an issue. Great, thanks. And also just, um, yeah, interesting question here from Beth Barker Stock, um, which has kind of been followed up by Mark Strong. Just this issue of, um, she says, in my experience, some of the disability advocacy groups are as prone to car centricity as anyone else. Um, it's perhaps inevitable, but how do we cut through that? Um, and I suppose I kind of have a, yeah, it does seem like um, there's a bit of imbalance that some of these groups that might be less car centric, like children, don't get the same, they don't have the same uh, voice in many ways as these other other groups. So, yeah, um, what can we do to address that? I mean, I suppose that some of this comes back to consultation, so we need to make sure that we are talking to these other groups, so to parents and children and, um, you know, pregnant women. Um, and at the moment, that's not really on the agenda that much. Um, and it can be quite difficult to do as well. <laughs> so, uh, they, yeah, children particularly don't seem to have 
there's no one advocating for them in terms of transport, whereas some of these other groups, they're adults, so they're able to advocate for themselves. But Adrian, have you got any thoughts on that as well? No, I mean, I agree with uh, Mary and Mark, you know, that when we do consultation, um, it, it, it is, uh, you know, trying to move existing disabled parking spaces um, or were still remove them altogether it is hugely controversial and it's quite difficult with the Equality Act because you you know you're potentially introducing a disbenefit over what's already there, even though it might be a benefit for a lot of other people. Uh, and um, you know that that's one of the sort of challenges that we face. Um, uh, and also, you know, do those the opinions of those people carry more weight than some of the other stakeholders um you know sometimes that is the interpretation but you know it, it may be uh you know uh, and it may take a strong politician or a strong officer to to kind of counter that so yeah it, it, it's um it's an ongoing problem um you know, uh, and obviously you try within design to sort of do the compromise that is best for everyone. Okay, and the, there's a question just on the value of time from Jonathan Carr. So um, he's sort of saying, apart from pressuring the DFT to increase value, value of time for these other types of trips, so the non-commuting trips, 85% of trips, um, what else can we do to demonstrate the value of money for schemes that improve accessibility? That's an interesting question. Um, have you got any thoughts on that, Adrian? How do we, how do we kind of increase the importance um, and prominence of these non-commuting trips in terms of the way that we appraise schemes? Yeah, I mean, it, it's something that the department has been looking at for uh, quite a long time as part of that overall uh, work on on sort of valuing active travel because regardless of your journey purpose around 70 percent of the benefits of walking and cycling are the health benefits um and you know that's just through doing the activity whether you're going to the shops or whether you're going to work so you know that the idea that um commute journeys are inherently more valuable and, and worse still that people who are driving cars are inherently more valuable than people who are walking, cycling or catching the bus. You know, it is one that needs to be constantly challenged. Um, uh, uh, and it re relates also to some of the um, earlier questions in the plenary session about this uh, the kind of interurban trips and and you know inadvertently through the kind of local cycling walking infrastructure plan process and, and the fact that we use the census journey to work data as one of the primary planning tools we we've kind of uh, ignored as you said in your presentation some of the sort of suburban areas which is where the all this travel to school trips go um, and the interurban areas which Graham Smith raised right at the beginning um, where people might be doing longer commutes on their e-bikes um, you know either to go to the shops or to you know to go to work so so I think there's probably a lot of work still to be done there um, and to re-examine um, you know so some of the assumptions that we're making about travel patterns and, and um, what is accessible accessible to active travel users yeah no that's that's interesting because often the dft seems to kind of suggest that um or some of the the um the text that's come out of them suggests that they're thinking that if a trip is longer it couldn't it doesn't involve a bicycle but you can have these trips where you cycle to a station which then gets you on a much longer distance journey um, so, yeah, cycling and walking doesn't just relate to the short trips. Yeah, uh, and that was also something that was picked up in the CWIS that they started to look at journey stages as the measure. So, so that if you were cycling to the station or walking to the station, that would still count as a cycle trip. But when it's recorded in the census, it is recorded as 
whatever the longest mile is, so it, it would count as a rail trip rather than a uh, a cycle and walking trip. So 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 that's uh, again an issue with data collection um, that um, you know we we don't generally collect very good accurate data about local travel. Um, you know there are exceptions. Uh, there are some local authorities in Greater Manchester, for example, that do have annual travel surveys uh, and within London you've got um, travel survey data as well so, so there is uh, some areas that have got better data than others. Great and then there's a question from Doug Mellon. Um, people with protected characteristics often report feeling acutely aware of others perceptions of them in public spaces. Any evidence dedicated is there any evidence dedicated space for cycling reduces these feelings of exposure? So I guess there's kind of two two kind of concerns for, for in terms of safety. There's the road danger, um, and then there's the personal safety aspect, both of which might apply to that question. Um, so in terms of road danger, I mean we know that that um, women in particular prefer protected space, but both men and women do. Um, and if, if people are accompanying children, they prefer protect, protected, uh, dedicated space for, for cycling, as do older people. Uh, so there is there is specific evidence for that. Um, I don't know whether that's a slightly different thing to the public spaces generally. Um, Adrian, have you got any more thoughts well, on that? Again, what one of the issues for visually impaired and blind people in particular is that where you've got kind of these big open public realm schemes it can be quite difficult to navigate so you know away from any conflict with um, wheeled traffic and in its various sorts and um, that that is one of the concerns that um, they have uh, around some of the infrastructure that is going in that that um, you know they rely on curbs and building lines and things to help them to navigate and get to learn routes through a space and if you don't have some of those kind of tactile or color contrasting elements within the sort of public realm design it can then be quite difficult for them and you know and also for guide dogs to uh, sort of navigate through the space so so uh, so, so there is probably again work that needs to be done within the industry using um, the not just blind people but but other people with different um, needs to understand how the public realm can better serve them. You know, in some countries there is a lot more use of positive guidance paving um, so so that you can navigate through public transport terminals, for example, um, but we tend not to use that very much in the UK. Okay, so that actually kind of relates to another question um, from someone who's anonymous. What are your thoughts on the value of tactile paving on cycle provision? Tactile paving guidance only provides advice for shared segregated paths by delineator strips. Um, value of tactile paving. I mean, there's guidance on that in LTM 120. So yeah, so would be, one, yeah, one thing that I think people have found in practice, both through the TFL schemes and a lot of the cycle ambition schemes, is that we can reduce the need for tactile paving when we're having some of these LTM 120 compliant designs because they are sort of self explanatory and curb separated. And, and so you don't have those kind of raised trapezoidal sections and and the ladder and tramline paving um it, it's quite often um a maintenance nightmare for for the local authorities because people drive on it and it all cracks up um uh, and also you can't put any kind of paint and things on it because again it all, all of that sort of cracks up so uh so i think there's a move generally to look at how we can simplify and minimize and, and i know that, that i don't know if the department has published but it, it certainly commissioned a review of the um tactile paving guidance a couple of years ago so uh, uh, again with a view to sort of making it as simple as possible because uh, 
it, it's quite easy to sort of tie yourself in knots once you get into a more complicated uh, junction, trying mm -hmm. to get the right set of tactiles uh, uh, and to get everything to line up. Yeah, and sometimes there's a bit of a, a conflict in a way between tactile pavings and what they do in terms of function um, and the fact that they don't look that great. <laughs> so then, if you're trying to do a kind of public realm improvement in a way, the last thing you want is, is hundreds of tactiles littering the, the surface. Um, so sometimes you kind of need to find a bit of a balance between those two two things. Um, there's a question here from Andrew Russ um, about equality impact assessments. So should um, should the equality impact assessment identify as aspects of schemes which affect people with protected characteristics and suggest mitigations? Since most designers don't even see the equality impact assessment, is the process fit for purpose? Well, that's a good question. Yeah. Have you, yeah. Well, I, I agree with Andrew that, you know, it, it's one of the things that we're kind of told we should do. Um, I, I can think in however many years I've been working, 20 odd years, I've done maybe three or four, um, you know, uh, and, and it, it's just not widely applied. Um, and it, a bit like cycle audit um, uh, and review, it tends to get done too late in the process. You know, when, when we've designed something, oh, let's do an uh, EQIA to see how well it it works, rather than you know doing it at the beginning and thinking about what you need to um, integrate into the design from from the start. So, uh, so yeah, I, I'd agree with Andrew that. You know, it, it, everything needs to start at the outline design stage at, at, at the, you know, very start of the process. Yeah, and it's kind of interesting, isn't it? Because we give different weight to different types of assessment as well of schemes. So the road safety audit is kind of a standard and very much accepted um, type of audit, but it's given much more weight often than something like a vulnerable road user audit or um, you know other other kinds of audits that might be in some ways more inclusive. I think in their in their outcomes. Um, yeah, that, so I'm just scrolling back through the yeah. questions. So, yeah. uh, I'm just you know again picking up on Mark's comment as well. Um, you know we, we see this again and again that um, we're told you know always told well give us the evidence and sometimes we come up with the evidence. Um, uh, and again, it comes back to some of the things that Becca was saying about some of the uh, attitude surveys as well. You know, we, we come up with all this evidence and we ask stakeholders. And then if the councillors don't like what they've been told from that evidence, they ignore it anyway. Um, you know, uh, and that that is one of the reasons, of course, why the Equality Act became legislation, because, you know, the same thing was happening. People were routinely ignoring the requirements of people with disabilities. And I think, you know, we, we need to think about how we are routinely ignoring some of these other needs of other types of users. And, you know, whether it is through legislation or whether it is through a more robust engagement process where if you want to challenge the results of that engagement, then you know you've got to uh, you've got to have an equally robust argument about why you are ignoring it. That you know that that um, you know that that needs to be how we move forward, really, to sort of take all these issues into give give them the same sort of weight that we tend to give safety audits. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it does seem like that there's a kind of a bit of a problem with the way that we do highways changes in that it is you know it does have to be approved by politicians and they're not necessarily people who are um you know in the same way that they might not be with uh, medical decisions they may not know much about transport um so it's a bit of a peculiar system in some ways um there was yeah there was this uh comment in gear change about potentially giving more power to the people in a way by uh, giving them the right to lobby, mind you, they have this right anyway, but giving them more control over their own streets in terms of asking for traffic reduction and asking for filters. Um, I mean, do you have any 
general any other thoughts i suppose on on that the, the kind of it, it seems like we're in a situation where the whole structure of transport and highways is is not really coming up with the answers that we need uh, to address traffic reduction and climate change yeah i, I mean it, it, it is very variable around the country isn't it that there are some local authorities that are kind of pushing ahead and um they've got the political support and the officers are kind of on board and they're able to make a lot of progress um and you know as becca was saying that the public are generally on board until the point where it's their parking space and their particular journey that is affected that we want to change and then they kind of uh, will dig their heels in um you know so, so that is still a kind of challenge that um everybody thinks it's a great idea you know to to kind of uh, combat climate change until it uh, is something that inconveniences their own lifestyle in which case they'll you know they, they'll fight to carry on doing what they're doing so so you know that's a challenge for all of us really um the the couple of things that mary uh, clark has, has just put in the comments as well that you know there is an urgency to this um that you know possibly we don't need to do some of this infrastructure if we're taking climate change seriously we can do things that are fairly low impact like low traffic neighborhoods traffic management that don't require us to build lots of hard infrastructure and all of the carbon that that takes um so 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 yeah i mean i don't think there are any easy answers because it, it is winning that political argument and that public opinion argument that we all have to change you know it's it's not just somebody else's responsibility yeah and no, i mean a lot of those in a way the the interventions that are slightly lower key um in, in at least in terms of their infrastructure like putting in planters or um ampr cameras to to remove through traffic those kinds of interventions actually produce much fairer outcomes as well in some ways than some of the heavier cycling infrastructure so um, yeah, that, that they the, the kind of the outcomes from those interventions, which are quite lightweight, can be very significant. Um, yeah, well, I don't think there's many more questions. There's a few comments coming in. Um, yeah, Mark Strong just following up on the equality impact assessment, saying there was a very robust one done for the old Shoreham Road scheme. Um, but then it was ignored, <laughs> it um, but it should be retained, but that was ignored by councillors. Um, so, yeah, so I suppose you can, you can kind of put in place all, all the guidance and um, paperwork and assessment that you can do and be as rigorous as possible, but it can still get ignored. And that's, that's an issue, isn't it? Yeah, I think the, the other, um, what one of the things that uh, Mark's put up is that link to uh, the seafront cycle path. And it, it, it's interesting, this kind of issue, um, it, it was something Richard uh, Smith from Coventry was talking about as well, was this to segregate um, off road cycle paths or to, you know, to have a shared surface. And um, there's that kind of dutch research on kind of what they call the scoff law cycling where where uh, people are essentially you know they they don't act like vehicles when they're walking and cycling they make these kind of micro adjustments to avoid one another and when i was working at steers we did some work with the cross river partnership looking at pedestrian cycle conflict and we were videoing different sort of high conflict locations um you know around the south bank and uh, around the angel at islington and so on um and what we saw was this inaction that when you're walking and cycling you do make these micro adjustments and and it very rarely results in a collision this kind of idea of accident waiting to happen 
doesn't actually happen, you know, or re very rarely happens. And even when it does, it's usually very low speed and very low key. It's not, you know, old lady gets uh, rammed into by the cyclists at 20 miles per hour, which is, you know, what the papers are looking for. Um, uh, and, you know, the Dutch have kind of taken this on board and they've been sort of redesigning some of their junctions to accommodate that kind of let's all go at once and uh, you know sort ourselves out whereas one of the consequences of the equality act in the uk and the way that we operate the traffic signals for example is that we do try to separate out conflicting pedestrian and cycle movements um we try and sort of separate those modes as much as possible but that then has impacts on the amount of space we need and the amount of time that we need at junctions um you know introducing delays to everybody you know pedestrians cyclists and motorists at, at the junction uh, and you know it, it's going to be continued to be one of the barriers to putting in some of the cycle routes really because um we don't always have that time or space yeah yeah, and kind of a similar point just come in from Mary Clark, which I completely agree with. Modelling should, you know, we should have the tools to model to reduce motor traffic flows. Um, and I think there's still a bit of a way to go before we have that. But we, we need that now because so many authorities are asking that question. What will happen if we remove a lane? What will happen if we put in a filter? Um, so we definitely need, need models that, that can model less traffic. Um, I don't know whether we're going to get kicked out at some point from... Oh, yes. um, time, yeah yeah i guess um but yeah if if anyone has a last question they want to put in or try and cover it within the time um although we may get cut off um yeah i suppose then i'll just ask one final question of you adrian um do you think ltm 120 goes far enough in terms of being inclusive uh well as you know, there were some things that we wanted to get in there <laughs> which didn't make the cut. Uh, so, so, you know, looking forward to seeing those in the next edition. Um, <laughs> it, you know, you can never go far enough. And one of the problems with writing the LTNs is that you are, essentially, you can only include things that are already proven designs. Um, you know, we've had a bit more flexibility in Wales with the Active Travel Wales guidance that the government, is, being a smaller organisation, is a bit more fleet of foot and is encouraging innovation. Um, that's been more difficult in England. And, um, you know, so, so things that we know local authorities are doing um, and that are happening within TfL and things like Cyclops Junctions in Manchester, kind of, you know, things haven't made the cut that will be in the next edition. So, uh, so yeah, we can always do better. Yeah, and maybe Manual for Streets 3. Um, yeah. Have, I mean, there's still a bit of a gap for research for things like whether children can use courtesy crossings and pedestrian refuges and so on, but... Um, yeah, we need, need some more research, if there's any researchers out there, on how children actually navigate these spaces um, that, that we provide for them. OK, um, I don't know whether there's someone from Landor um, on this call, but it would be quite good to know when we're going to get kicked off. <laughs> um, That's it's just down to us to uh, yeah, just bring it to a close. Yeah. OK, well, thanks, everyone. Great questions. And thanks, Adrian, as well. Okay, th thanks everyone. See you soon. Bye-bye.